All right. Um, thanks everyone for joining today for the session. We um, are going to be talking about this very brief little session around um, the change in Bill 44 and the exclusion of secret ballots at electronic meetings. But we're going to also, you know, touch on some other areas that relate to this directly to um, um, uh, address issues like um, uh, using um, uh, services for platforms for voting and stuff and that, you know, how those can provide um, some support for you for general meetings, um, as well as some of the other issues that have come up um, around proxies and other items. So, um, again, use the Q&A. Um, Veronica Franco from Clark Wilson is um, graciously going to be your speaker today. Um, and um, just an acknowledgement to Premium Fence, um, who are our um, sponsor this week. Um, thank you very much for your support. Um, it's very much appreciated. Uh, please post your um, questions through the Q&A function. Um, we use it and it is um, essentially blocked. So we try to do everything we can to protect privacy of everyone. Um, but it just on your for your own protection, don't put any personal information into your questions, um, but keep them generic. Um, the PowerPoint will get posted. And if we have no technical difficulties today, um, this video will get posted to the YouTube website as well. And just a reminder, um, with respects um, to personal information and the nature of this seminar, um, is that we, this does not constitute legal advice because the speakers, um, no one is aware of the particulars and the details um, of the situation that you may be dealing with. But afterwards, you're more than welcome to reach out to anyone um, for assistance. So without any further ado, Veronica. So I'm here to talk about electronic meetings and um, really the, a bit of the fallout as well as um, from the legislation or you know, the legislative changes that happened um, late last year. So effective November 24, 2022, the notice, your notice of an electronic meeting must include the instructions of attending the meeting. Um, the chairperson has to be capable of identifying eligible voters and voting cards are not required for electronic meetings as well electronic eligible voters are not required or entitled to vote by secret ballot and those really were changes that were prompted because of the difficulties of having voting cards and having secret ballots in um, electronic meetings so the specific changes are set out in section 45 subsection 3 so um, now it has now it requires that the notice of an annual or special general meeting has to include a description of the matters that will be voted on at the meeting, including the proposed wording of any resolution requiring a three quarter vote an 80% or a unanimous vote, and that was always there in the legislation so that hasn't changed what has been added is subsection B and C which says the date time and if applicable the place of the meeting, and so I just pause to note that. That to me is weird that that was never there before. And I remember the first one of like one of my earlier days of um, practicing in this area and looking at section 45, it tells you what you're supposed to put in your notice package and nowhere did it say the date, time and the place of the meeting. But of course, the only way to give notice so that actually somebody can attend is to provide the date, time and place of the meeting. So that was always sort of implicit, but now it's explicitly in the legislation. Um, in addition, it deals with electronic meetings so that if you're doing a telephone meeting or any other kind of electronic meeting, so by Zoom or some other web uh, platform, um, instructions for attending the meeting by electronic means. So the notice package has to include instructions on how you can attend that electronic meeting. So um, section 49 has also been amended. Um, it now provides that if the re that certain requirements are needed uh, in order to um, have your attendance and voting by telephone or electronic meetings at an AGM or SGM. So if you meet these requirements, you're good to go. So the requirements for the purposes of subsection one are that the notice given under section 45 has to include the instructions for attending the meeting by electronic means. So once again, it emphasizes the fact that you have to include instructions so that people know how to log in to their electronic meeting or how to join the electronic meeting. 
Uh, the electronic um, means has to allow people attending to communicate with each other. And the electronic means must allow the chair of the meeting to identify whether a person attending by electronic means is an eligible voter. So um, we know that electronic meetings are permitted now as a result of these legislative changes. And so what we have um, is some exceptions to the typical um, scenarios with um, a normal general meeting or a general meeting that's held in person from that of an electronic meeting. So subsection three says that a voting card is not required to be issued to an eligible voter that's attending um, an annual or special general meeting by electronic means and an eligible voter attending an annual or special general meeting by electronic means is not entitled or required to vote by secret ballot. And then um, the pers a person who attends an, an AGM or SGM is deemed to be uh, electronically, is deemed to be present in person at the meeting. So really what are the basics here? Um, the basics is that the electronic general meeting is really the same and is in-person meeting. The lo instead of an address or a physical address for uh, your meeting, what you'd have is the electronic address or the phone number that's included in the notice of um, meeting package. Proxies are certified in the same way and will require a copy of the proxy to be provided to the chair uh, the, of the meeting at to be certified. So what you often see that in an electronic meeting is that it's either submitted by um, email at the time of the meeting, or it's um, you'll see the proxy shown on the, so they'll show the proxy on the screen so that the chair who, or the person who's just doing the registration at the meeting is able to uh, read the proxy from the screen. And then the named proxy voter holder or an owner must attend the meeting and register to be eligible to vote for the resolution. So it's not enough, like a, a number of uh, strata corporations will ask for the proxies to be delivered uh, in anticipation of the meeting. That's fine as long as you allow still people to, re uh, to submit their proxies at the time of the meeting, but you're still required to see that proxy and that person who is the proxy has to be available at, um, of the time of the meeting and register at the time of the meeting because they're the ones that are voting because the proxy isn't the document the proxy is the person okay um so issuing your notice package so it's the same way you would issue your uh notice package for a in-person general meeting so you still do you know mail email deli like delivery the way you would normally do um, but at least a week, uh, an electronic information meeting at least a week before helps owners and proxy holders to communicate in advance and owners unable to participate to assign a proxy with their specific instruction. So the proxy and that proxy can be general or it can set out some restrictions or limitations or directions on the proxy. Um, the, the information meeting is not mandatory, but it's one of those things that it probably makes a lot of sense, particularly when you have a complicated or long and lengthy agenda and you are anticipating a lot of questions. Um, it's no different, actually, than in an in-person meeting. In an in-person meeting, I would have, if you had a complicated agenda or lo a long agenda and you know you were going to get a lot of questions, I would probably recommend that you have an information meeting ahead of time so that you can hopefully streamline your general meeting and deal with the business and not spend too much time on discussion. But it, this is even more so, I think, in an electronic meeting, um, because then you can focus on that discussion and um, getting people information ahead of time than you would in the electronic meeting. Uh, assign tasks before the meeting. So it's uh, one of those scenarios where it, you probably need a team of people uh, to help you run the meeting smoothly. So you're going to have to figure out who's going to be managing the registration, who's going to be chairing the meeting, who's conducting the voting, who's acting as the scrutineers, and who's producing the minutes. Um, again, those are things that you would do in a general, uh, an in-person general meeting, but those are things that you got to be so, uh, got to be so routine that you didn't think about it. But in an electronic meeting, it's those same issues that you have to think about. Um, with the additional 
issue of having to navigate the electronic platform, right? So that um, can sometimes um, be a bit more challenging. And so even more so, you want to be really clear on the tasks. Uh, it's not a bad idea to include a sample uh, proxy form with instructions that can be completed and, assi and assigned by an owner. Um, I know the CRT has talked a lot about restricted proxies and how you're not allowed to have meetings by restricted proxies, et cetera. But to be very, you know, what's what's clear also is that there's no problem with having a proxy that sets out the directions on voting uh, or to have limitations. But really the issue is that the choices with the owner that's granting the proxy, they decide what the proxy um, can and can't do. So the proxy is the person representing the owner, as I mentioned, it's the proxy isn't the document, it's the person who is going to be doing the voting for the owner at the meeting. The proxy form does not ca cast absentee votes, so it doesn't matter that you've provided the proxy ahead of time, it doesn't matter that the proxy has the instructions on how it's going to be voted, in order for the vote to count the proxy person who's attending the meeting has to be there at the time the vote is um, called and that's it's that so that they can actually vote um, as directed by the proxy uh, by the owner I mean okay so this is a sample um, agenda uh, in terms of a uh, of a um, sorry, a sample agenda. So you see here, they're going to run their meeting by Zoom. It's a special general meeting. It's going to be starting at noon by Zoom. And then they say the registrations at 11 a.m. And then you've got um, your agenda, agenda items, which follow what's um, set out in the standard bylaws. So you call to order, certify proxies and corporate representatives, issue voting cards, uh, determine quorum, elect a person to chair if the meeting if that's necessary, then file the proof of notice of the meeting, approve the agenda, approve the minutes, uh, reports of council if there are any, ratify any rules or, or amendments adopted by the council since the previous general meeting, the report on, on insurance, and then here you have um, uh, some items on the agenda that's going to require voting. So approve the budget if this is an annual general meeting, uh, new business that has been given where notice has been given. So you'd include the resolutions by topic and the exact wording of three quarter vote, 80% and unanimous votes in the notice package. And so then you would list out um, what those uh, resolutions are. And here one would be resolution one would be bylaw amendments. And then uh, resolution two is uh, prove the significant change in appearance. Then, because it's a, if the if it's a, an annual general meeting, the next item on the agenda would be the election of a council meeting, and then the meeting termination. So again, it looks exactly like it would in an in-person meeting, other than it's noted that it's by Zoom. Okay. So then, this is what you might see as um, instructions on for the notice package. And so you've got the strata plan number, the, that it's a notice of a special general meeting or an annual general meeting. It specifies the date, the day of the week, the time of the meeting and the registration time. So the date, uh, time and location there. This is a Zoom meeting. And then you would set out um, the, the address or the login information uh, so that people can log into the meeting, whether it's whatever platform you're using and then if um it's going to be by phone then or you're allowing phone in then you would print the local phone number for people to call um for people to call and then it sets out the dear the dear owners the agenda notice of meeting is attached if you're attending electronically, please join the meeting by computer or smartphone, or you may dial into the phone number provided. Voting is to be in accordance with the bylaws and secret ballots will not be permitted because this is all gonna be electronically. Um, voting on the proposed agenda items such as budget, three quarter vote, 80% or unanimous resolutions will be conducted by poll, show of hands or ballots as set out in the agendas. Um, please keep your computer or phone on mute. The system administrator will register you and any proxies that may uh, you may be representing. And then a co any copies of the proxies must be issued or presented to the chair or the regist 
registration person so they can be certified and then you could list email addresses where they can send a copy of the completed proxy form and then if you're not able to attend and wish to use a proxy you can use the attached optional proxy form so it's clear that whatever form you're attaching is an optional form okay so what does the um what must the proxy contain so um the strata property act sets out what um what what it, what re what requirements are for a proxy and um there was this case uh mcdonald versus the owner strata plan eps 522 um, in the BC Supreme Court, which interpreted that in the context of a general meeting where there were some issues around the proxies. So um, blank proxies are invalid. So just even if you just have the signature at the bottom, if you don't have, if it's not completely filled out, setting out who the proxy person is, who the proxy will be, um, then who you are, who the owner is, uh, then uh, it's invalid. The proxies have to identify an individual as the proxy holder. So you can't uh, just, um, so it actually has to set out the name of the person who's going to be the proxy. The proxy holder's name should be inserted before signing the proxy. So it's not um, good enough to sign the proxy and then at the meeting put in the person's name who's going to hold the proxy it should be completely filled out uh, before you get there and if it's going if there are changes which is totally fine um it's a good idea to initial them which is what's addressed in item f there so if let's say you change your mind on who's going to be the proxy then the then the uh, name should be crossed out the new name put in and that amendment should be initialed by the owner um, proxy stating any council member are is are not valid. Uh, you actually have to name the council member that you wish to assign. It's also not good to just say the council president. It should actually be the person's name. The proxies uh, can be signed manually or digitally, um, and they can be sent as you can see by email, or they can be handed in in person um, to well, assuming that the meeting is not electronic. So what's included in the uh, notice package, you're going to have your agenda. Um, so and remember the agenda, if you have standard bylaw 28, it sets out the order of the agenda. Um, or if you've amended your bylaws, you follow what's um, in your bylaws. Then if you ha are going to have any three quarter vote, 80% vote or unanimous vote resolutions, that has to be included as well in the notice package under new business. If it's an AGM, you're going to have the proposed budget and the schedule of strata fees. Um, if it's an AGM, you're going to also include the financial statements for all of the accounts showing both the opening and closing balances and the details of any expenditures or revenues from each of those accounts. Uh, a sample proxy form for the convenience of, of owners may be included, but that is not mandatory to include one. Instructions on how to register for an electronic meeting is mandatory to include if you're doing it by electronic uh, electronically. The procedures for voting will be how the voting will be conducted can be included in the notice. So you, again, not mandatory, but you can include it. If it's an AGM, you must include a report on insurance. And if you're going to have an information meeting, um, then it's a good idea to include that information in your notice package so you can include it in the schedule. Okay, when doing registration, it's um, best practice to identify by strata lot or unit a unit number. Um, and if it's an electronic meeting, um, each as each person is allowed into the uh, re from the waiting room into the main room, you can identify each participant so that the chairperson can easily see who the eligible voters are. And you may you can identify either their unit number or their um, or their strata lot number and then any proxies. So like, for example, here on Zoom, if it was by Zoom, you see my name, but instead of actually having my name, you'd see strata lot three. And if I hold um, three proxies as well, it'd be strata lot three plus three proxies. Um, if ballots or proxies are being issued, confirm the correct unit number or strata lot number that was written on each form. So you wanna make sure that's all accurate. And the, um, Register the person doing the registration, the property manager, the meeting administrator, or the council member is going to require copies of all proxies to be able to certify they're valid for the meeting. So 
um, they need to physically see, be able to see the proxies during registration uh, so that they can allow people uh, into the meeting. And then provide an email address with instructions and a date for receipt of uh, the, the uh, proxy is a good idea as well. So in terms of voting, um, the standard bylaws is the, usually the starting point. So uh, the standard bylaw states that at AGMs and SGMs, voting cards must be issued to eligible voters. So that's mandatory. And again, when it comes to electronic meetings, since you're not there physically, um, it uh, it's you, you can't really give somebody a voting card. Um, I know pre this the change in legislation, um, we would talk about the you know my little square on Zoom and then me being reassigned Stratalot three plus three uh, proxies as being the equivalent of a voting card, but no court or tribunal had ever made that decision or determination. And so instead, what we have now is this. Um, revision or amendment to the bylaws that that uh, sorry amendment to the legislation which says that with respect to electronic meetings you don't need voting cards but still um, the, the reason for the remember half the rationale for voting cards the rationale for voting cards is so that the person who is counting the votes uh, can identify who are the eligible voters and only count their them as um, voting in one way or the other. So similarly, in an electronic meeting, you need the chair or the person the person who's helping to, to do the, the voting must be able to identify who are the eligible voters. And so that's why it's a good idea, for example, in a Zoom scenario to rename me instead of my name as uh, my strata lot number plus how many proxies I might hold, because then you'll know that I'm there for my strata lot three, um, and I'm also the eligible voter for my three proxies. Um, so in terms of the second uh, subsection two, it says at an annual or special general meeting, a vote is decided on a show of voting cards unless an eligible voter requests a precise count. Um, and then when you're dealing with an electronic meeting, you have to think about um, other ways of voting because, of course, um, if there is no uh, voting card. So um, sometimes it's, you know, you'll ask people to use the raise hand function, for example, on Zoom, and then you physically count uh, the raise hand function. And that could be, for example, the equivalent of uh, show of voting cards. But essentially, you're, you're trying to figure out how you can make the equivalent of what subsection two um, is setting out. If uh, subsection three says, if a precise count is requested, the chair must decide whether it'll be by a show of voting cards or by roll call, secret ballot, or some other method. Um, and so you don't have to have one of those methods. There could be another method that you can come up with that uh, allows you to count the votes uh, in, a, in a precise count sort of way. Electronic voting platforms and emailed ballots at the time of the vote uh, is called may, quali may qualify as some other method. So you may have, um, there are some electronic voting platforms out there that um, promote themselves as being able to um, assist with voting in a strata corporation context. Um, so those may be um, some other method that you could use for precise counts. Uh, similarly, emailed ballots. So, for example, we call the vote right now. If this is, if this were a general meeting, we call the vote right now. Um, the vote, the meeting would continue, but there would be a 15 minute or a half an hour um, period where people can email their vote, um, and that would be an emailed ballot, and um, that would be per that perhaps can be interpreted as some other method than uh, the for a precise count. Okay, <clears throat> so there's a number of different methods that are allowed under the standard bylaws. Um, so what, what you also have to do, though, is to see if um, your bylaws have been amended, uh, sorry, amended to, um, to either limit or enhance uh, the ability to vote. Uh, so, uh, for example, I've seen some strata corporations, like if you follow if you go through all of um, bylaw 27, the last one specifically allows an uh, an owner to request a special, sorry, a secret ballot if, with respect to a council election 
or any other resolution if requested by an owner. Um, some people have limited that, uh, either eliminated that one or limited to only allow for secret ballots call a request by an owner if requested for specific types of votes, right? Because the way that bylaw is written, it, a, an owner could ask for a secret ballot for approving the minutes. So um, they might now have it so that it's only for sort of those bigger votes, right? They might have amended it to say only for three quarter votes, 80% votes, unanimous votes and council elections. Um, so you always have to check the bylaws to make sure that you are conforming to the voting requirements set out in the bylaws. Um, then in addition, you're gonna wanna identify your notice package. The secret ballot may not be possible given how electronic meetings work. Um, however, ballots, um, and may be retained by the scrutineer or manager once the voting is calculated. So um, the idea is really to try uh, to try to come as close as you possibly can to a secret ballot. I mean, the, the exemption wasn't meant to eliminate the right to a secret ballot, but really to recognize the practical realities of an electronic meeting um, and that it may not be possible for no one to know how somebody voted, right? So if we had, you might have a third party, you might have one person, or the, maybe it's the strata manager who's um, doing a roll call or asking people to um, vote through the through the chat, for example. And so they're going to know um, how people vote, but the rest of the owners don't know how everyone's gonna vote. So it's not meant to be a free for all so that nobody, so that everybody knows how everybody votes, but it's meant to recognize that it, in, in running the meeting electronically, um, a secret, a, a true secret ballot is just not possible. Okay, so um, for majority and three quarter votes, the same definition applies. So you, um, abstentions, for example, don't count. So it's 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 um, just those who vote yes and no, and it's, it has to meet that three quarter vote threshold or that uh, majority vote threshold. So those who have voted for and against the resolution and who have not abstained at the time the vote is taken. So when we vote options, a call of the roll can be conducted when a vote is taken, and so that would require the chair to verbally ask each person and the proxy at the meeting how they vote, whether they're voting for, against, or abstaining. You could have the visual raise hand function, so um, you can have people raise their, show the raise of hand function. Um, that shows up with a little hand in the, in the square. A ballot can be used with a designated email or text for a scrutineer, um, and then the, but the chairperson is still responsible for monitoring the voting. Um, the electronic voting platforms uh, are, are a successful alternative provided the chairperson can identify the eligible voters and who has voted. So um, the difficulty, for example, with um, some, like if you were to use the poll plot, uh, sorry, the poll platform in Zoom, is you're going to want to make sure that only those people that are permitted to vote who are who are eligible voters are permitted to vote and that they're permitted to vote each, uh, the total number of votes that they represent. Um, so it can be done, but it, it does require some planning and thinking ahead, um, or you can have a third party platform that does the same thing. But again, the, the idea is making sure that it's only the eligible voters that are voting um, and that they're able to vote all of the votes that they represent at the meeting. Okay, so what if the strata is mixed use? So you've got residential and non-residential or what many people refer to as commercial. Um, and so there, that's where things get a little bit more, I'll say, say complicated, so you have to think about it. Um, again, you also have to think about it in an in-person meeting, but I think in an electronic meeting, it's even more highlighted. Uh, oftentimes with non-residential strata lots, their vote is not one. It's uh, going to be uh, some kind of decimal. So it'll be, it could be less than one. It could be more than one. Um, so you're going to have to identify and allocate the correct number of votes to those, uh, to those voters. <laughs> so for example, if again, I'm representing strata lot three and my vote count is 1.75, then you're going to want to put um, not just that I'm representing strata lot three, but my, my vote count so that it's 1.75. 
So yes, I think at the ex example there you have at the bottom. So not all platforms are secure or confidential. If your meeting requires a confidentiality agreement or contains privileged information, seek assistance on about the proceedings before you start the meeting. Um, that's something you don't want to address on the fly. And before you start the meeting, advise the parties if you're recording the meeting and seek the majority consent of the owners. So a lot of um, you, a lot of time, well, depending on the platform, some of the platforms they'll tell you when they're recording and they'll ask you to agree um but uh, some of them don't but so out of a out of caution uh what you want to do is actually get that majority consent um before you do the recording of the meeting okay minutes minutes uh minutes really publish the decisions of the owners so you want to set out the accurate results of votes that support those uh decisions so if you're doing a call of the roll the result of each vote by each strata lot uh, is recorded in the minutes. So if you're doing a proper roll call, if you um, are doing, for example, um, raising or using the raise hand function, or you would just set out how many for, how many against, and how many abstentions. Uh, it's a good idea to include details of the mode voting methods. So if you're using something that isn't, um, like if you're doing a precise count and you're doing, let's say, an email ballot, for example, you're going to, you you may want to set out um, how that was, how that voting took place, and then um, set out the total number of proxies and registered owners and all voting results in the minute. So you're going to normally, um, as you did in general meetings, you'd say the total number of people in attendance in person, and then the total number in attendance by proxy. And so that should be set out. And then for each resolution um, that is uh, passed or, or not passed, for each resolution that is voted, you're going to want to set out the voting results in the minutes. The election of council is a majority vote under the Strata Property Act under Section 50, and uh, you should include the names of the nominated and elected council members in the minutes. So <clears throat> nomination and election of council. When the notice package is issued, the Strata Corporation can list, uh, can include a list of identified persons who are eligible for election. Um, and unless there's a method established in the bylaws for a nominating process, nominations are open to every eligible owner or potential council member permitted in your bylaws. So, uh, so uh, you should have an, a method for adding additional council no nominees uh, prior to the election. So whether that's an information or town hall meeting prior to the general meeting or at the general meeting at the time of nomination and election of the council um, when that's on the agenda. So the council does not have the authority to exclude eligible council members from being on the list for elections. The nomination election process is within the authority of the owners at a general meeting. So you can run your nomination and your election of council like you would at a typical general meeting. So you don't include anything in your notice package. People who attend nominate from the floor and you proceed that way. Um, another way is you can call for nominations in anticipation of issuing the notice package so that anybody who wants to step forward can submit their name and a one or two sentence of why they want to stand for council and that can be included. Um, and then, but, but if you do do that, which is great that you canvas that all, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that people could decide at the last minute to run for council and that they are permitted to do so. So that's why you have to establish this other, another method to add additional council nominees, even if you decide to do sort of a pre-call for nominations, because those people are still entitled to, um, to run for council. And um, the, you know, the ideal is for you to have them um, stand up at the council meeting, for example, uh, sorry, at the general meeting and they can be nominated from the floor there. Well done. Thanks. And you hardly took a breath at all. That was great. So. I know. I try <laughs> to do that to make sure that we leave room for questions. Um, we have a great bunch of questions. Um, and they're, they're things I think that everyone is probably sharing. Um, the, the most common question, though, that we're getting pretty much every day is about hybrid meetings. Um, and can you have both electronic and in-person? And I'm just looking back, I think the first meeting that I chaired that was both in-person and electronically was actually in 2000. 
and it involved people on Skype that were attending a general meeting as permitted under the bylaws of the Strata at the time at a resort property. So yeah. you know, we've been doing them for a long time. Yeah, resort properties have been way ahead of the game on this one um, because of the nature of resort properties. They don't live there. Um, and so a lot of resort properties have been doing hybrids or um, electronic meetings long before COVID happened. Uh, I think the key is that you still have to comply with the act. So as long as you're complying with the act and your bylaws, then you can have hybrid. Um, the, I think the toughest part is that that requirement that everybody has to be able to communicate with each other. So you can have it hybrid, but you're going to have to have it in such a way so that the people who are attending electronically are permitted to speak to the people who are in attendance in person. So I've seen it done. I've seen it done successfully. I think it just requires more manpower than if you're doing it purely electronically. Um, if you're doing it purely electronically, uh, then you, you're you not having to watch the in-person thing happening because there's nobody, nobody in person. But the minute you have uh, people electronic and in person, you're probably going to have somebody who's sort of watching things in person, but then you're probably going to need to have somebody to help you monitor what's happening online at the same time. We, it's interesting what we what we see commonly happen is you'll have four or five people in one unit around a, around one computer. The, the computer savvy person with a decent internet connection will link up and then you'll have four or five other owners who join them. And that's kind of a hybrid meeting, really. Yeah. But, you know, as the chairperson, you need to identify clearly who's in the room, see them, talk to them, make sure they can hear what's going on. Um, and then when it comes to voting, you have to ask them in the room how they're voting. So, you know, you're not you're not calling a roll, but you're you're essentially doing a kind of a verbal hands up to verify how people are voting. Um, Again, as long as the chairperson can always identify who's there, they can calculate who's voting, um, and that people can participate, it's a good solution. It did open the door, though, and I've heard this debate a few times, on the quirky situation of, we're doing an in-person meeting, but we're allowing people to elect to attend electronically. Can we have a secret ballot for the people that are in person? And what about the people that are electronic? And and I guess the real issue comes down to if you start to use multiple voting methods for one resolution, um, it's it's probably court in trouble, I would suspect. Yeah, I mean, it's all of it is about making sure that you don't mess up, so to speak. I mean, I can see why you you might end up with um, like in some respects doing the secret ballot can be easier in person in the sense that you've got somebody putting something in a ballot box and you've got these physical things that you count as opposed to the hands that are up and down and up and down right and so yeah. I can see the the desire to do that to even just for simplicity's sake but then you still have this electronic thing happening that you can't give them the ability to have a secret ballot right so then that's um, and, and yeah, I think you're more prone to errors, the more methods of, of voting you try to interject in a single resolution, right? I, I chaired a meeting a few weeks ago where we did everything by ballot. So it wasn't a secret ballot. And there were a combination of people in the room as well as people online. And the scrutineers did a very good job because people in the room basically cast their ballots. They were issued ballots for the units and people who were online emailed their ballot instructions to the scrutineer. So, you know, they weren't secret, which, which is where you get down in the problem, right? Um, but they weren't secret ballots. But it the one thing I find, I agree with you, the, the raise hand function in the room, um, you know, you do the test with a crowd of people and ask them yes or no, and then go back them and ask them yes or no again on the same issue, a whole bunch of people change their mind, right? And and so you don't know if people, and especially in a large room, are people voting twice? You know, how is it occurring to get accuracy? I find the electronic method when you're using ballots is incredibly accurate, which really helps a lot. Um, do majority vote agenda items require exact wording? No. 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 So the only thing that requires exact um, wording are three-quarter vote resolutions 
uh, 80 percent resolutions and unanimous vote resolutions. Excuse me. A um, few proxy questions. First one is, what's the difference between a restricted or unrestricted proxy? And I came across this last week where there were three proxies issued that were restricted in the sense that the proxy assigned was not permitted to use the proxy for voting on council elections. That was a yeah. good example of a restricted proxy. Yeah. I mean, really, that's it, it, it's what it says is there is some kind of restriction on the person who's who's the proxy. So an unrestricted proxy, right? Like a you know the is it, is like the proxy that they include in the in the regulations under the sample form the form A, which essentially gives the proxy the ability to vote uh, or uh, on be or to, the ability to stand in the person of the owner at the meeting. So they're permit they are allowed to raise their hand. Uh, make statements or uh, during discussions at resolutions, um, uh, ask for a call for amendments, vote. Uh, they, so they do everything that a proxy that the owner can do. Um, whereas a proxy with restrictions or a restricted proxy, which I think is a dirty word and we should never use again, but a proxy okay. with restrictions. You brought it up first. <laughs> I know. <laughs> a proxy with restrictions on it is just a proxy that we've done. You've actually include some limitations. So whether that's directions on how to vote, whether they're allowed to vote on amendments, whether they're not allowed to vote on amendments, whether they're allowed to, to only vote on one matter or only vote on council or not vote on council election. So it's, it, it, it is just a, pro a proxy that has some kind of limitation or restriction that does not allow the proxy to, to stand in, entirely in the shoes of the owner. Which goes right to the next issue, which I always have a struggle with, with getting it from, who, if I'm chairing a meeting, getting it from the person who did registration or the property manager, the chairperson needs to see the registration list and whether there's any restrictions on any proxies when they call for votes. Yes, because if, if for example, it. in your example, the person is not, a, not um, is restricted from voting on council election, then you can't let them vote on the council election. Exactly, exactly. And that's, I, I think that a lot of people forget how much incredible responsibility there is on the uh, and authority on the shoulders of the chairperson. Um, that's the person either elected or by deemed by election out of council, who's basically given the authority of the corporation to run these meetings and make decisions. And so it's, you know, combination, curse, a blessing and a curse sometimes. Um, how long do you keep proxies for after a meeting? Everybody always wants to know, do we have to keep proxies, which is the big question. Yeah, I mean, you know, under the under the act, there is no um, like proxies are not a record of the strata corporation. So there's no requirement to keep them under the act under PIPA, um, where a document is used for making a decision, there's a requirement to keep those documents for a year. But um, like under the Strata Property Act, there is, there is it's, it's not a record in, in theory, they can be, this is why you can destroy ballots, right, as well. Um, from whether you, you know, again, it's kind of like the perspective of the destruction of ballot issue. If the meeting is super controversial, you're going to keep those things uh, for a while because you you know that it's likely to come up as an issue and you want to have the documentation to back up the vote or the, the votes or the results. Similarly, if the if the meeting is super controversial, you're going to want to keep the results or the, the proxies um, so that you can deal with any issues that come up uh, with respect to the meeting. And like I said, I think uh, from a PIPA perspective, you may want to include, include it for, uh, keep it for a year for that, those purposes only. Um, but again, because it's not a record of the Strata Corporation, people don't have a right to see those proxies. Uh, it goes to the ballots as well, too. You know, it, the Strata Corporations are going to be voting by ballot. They're going to be generating um, um, emails and whatnot. 
um, if the strata corporation within within a number of rules of order, you'll see um, the motion to destroy ballots before the termination of the meeting. Um, not always a wise thing, though. Like you said, if you have a complicated resolution, like a an eighty percent wind up vote um, or a unanimous vote for a change to a strata plan, um, it's going to need some other provisions. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we're, I've kind of gone brazed over a whole bunch of them and read our time limit. Oh, one more question though. Um, uh, who decides a meeting's electronic? The council decides. And I think that's come up as a bit of a, I've seen a number of people ask that question is how can we make the council or how can we make the um, Strata Corporation not hold their meeting electronically because they want to revert back to in person, and the the issue is that it that, that is a council decision. So the the council is the one that issues the notice package and determines the location of the meeting, including whether it is an electronic meeting or not. So could a Strata Corporation petition for an agenda item at the next AGM to vote by majority vote for what the next? Um, type of general meeting will be, whether it's in person or electronic. Could well, they, I mean, there's there's that provision in the act that. that allows you to direct council, right? right? So right. Um, I think you could direct council to hold a meeting um, uh, in person or to hold the next general meeting in person, but that direction to council has to happen at a general meeting. Right. right. So, right. And it's not a bylaw provision. So it wouldn't be a matter of strata owners directing or restricting council um, with the matter of bylaws, which is not permitted. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, polling is the other issue. You you kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, um, we find stratas um, using electronic uh, meetings and platforms are using polling functions. But you, as you clearly pointed out, polling is problematic because you can't identify who voted or frequently the number of votes that were cast. It's only percentages is really what it gives you. And it might give you a gross number and say 81, if there were 81 who participated, but um, polling won't work for proportional voting like um, commercial. Um, type properties. But the other problem with it is, is you really don't know who's voting. And that's, that's a problem for the chairperson. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the, the difficulty, right? Like you don't have the, you don't, when you call the vote, you don't know who's actually doing the vote. Um, and that, that is the difficulty with, with um, a lot of the polling functions. Um, I know some people try to, to do workarounds, right? By like, for example, I've seen um, some strata corporations move all of the non-voting people into a waiting room so that only the um, those that are voting are left to vote. Um, but then you still have to, depending on the polling function, you still have to overcome the fact that you need to know the actual results of the vote. So you've got to know how many strata lots, how or how, sorry, not strata lots, how many votes were in favor, how many votes were against, and how many votes uh, were abstentions. Um, and so whatever the polling function may be, you'd have to be able to do that. So one more issue um, around the proxies, which, and I think there's still a lot of confusion about this. Generally, when somebody fills in a proxy, you know, the strata or the management company sent out the notice, there are three resolutions. So they put the three resolutions on the proxy form um, with instructions. That, um, and so people just check off the three, how they want them to vote, hand them over to their proxy. They assume that that person is going to vote the way they've instructed, but that's an instruction, not a restriction. Um, would you say that the proxy itself should actually have a very clear restriction that this proxy must be exercised the following way and is restricted only for this use? Um, but the other thing is, if you end up voting by ballot, how would you know how they're going to vote? Well, in? and I think you can't. Like the reality is, I don't. I think you can't. The instructions on the proxy really are just an instruction between the owner and the person you granted the proxy to. So it's really important that you choose your proxy carefully, right? It has to be somebody that you trust and is going to vote in the manner that you direct them to vote um, because it isn't the job of the council to police it because it's quite, I mean, and I, you know, I say this is 
what happens if during the meeting, a whole bunch of information is provided? And what happens if the proxy then is texting the owner and says, did you know this? They said this. Do you still want to vote the same way? I mean, yeah. they could change their mind. And they're, they're still following the instructions of the of the owner, but it's just different than what's set out in the proxy. And so um, the reality is, is that those directions really are meant for, um, to be between, to, to give the proxy an idea of what uh, the person or how the person wants to vote. And it, I think it's really important when you hand over your proxy, that you have a conversation with the proxy so that they understand what it is that you're you're telling them like for example if it's at an AGM and there's a change somebody proposes an amendment to the budget let's say you had instructed them yeah you know what I'm okay with the budget as it is but what if somebody proposes an increase to the CRF contribution by a hundred thousand dollars and that's going to result in an increase in strata fees of over ten percent well what about that do you are you know are you going to still want me to vote do you want me to try to reach you so that I can get instructions for you uh, or are you going to want me to abstain in that scenario so I uh, having those conversations can ensure that you as the owner know that the proxy is going to actually be able to follow your instructions otherwise they're kind of left at the meeting going oh the proxy only says this. I don't know what to do in this circumstance, right? So it's kind of anticipating and having that, uh, I think, good communication between the owner and the proxy. I was going to say one of the strategies as chairperson, now that secret ballots are not permitted in this circumstance, that I use is if one person is holding a lot of proxies and there is a significant vote um, that could have a substantial impact. We call the roll and record the results of the votes of all the eligible votes in the room. Um, and that way there, it almost compels the person holding all those proxies to vote as they're instructed. Yeah. Um, you know, it doesn't give them a blank, a blank slate to just vote on their own agenda. So that's, you know, that can be really a, a helpful method to do that. Um, we know that email um, provided it meets all the conditions of um, uh, of the requirements of what has to be included in the proxy can be and it can be a legitimate proxy because it it produces an electronic signature of that owner, but it's going to have to identify that owner and their unit number so that it can be verified. Um, what, the other thing, which I think goes, you know, it's a little on a different subject, but it's close without having um, secret ballots um, for the election of council. Um, you know, it, it becomes a bit more personal, you know, who's popular, who's not popular, um, but you can still use ballots, you know, ballots will still keep a little bit of an arm's length, the point to scrutineer, um, still use ballots, and then that way there you can do a number of things, you can track who's voting, and that they're not voting for more than seven, or voting twice, um, gives you a better audit of the results, um, but, but it does create some interesting consequences in communities, um, when you're electing council and there's some animosity between parties, doesn't it? Oh, for sure. I mean, that that is um, the difficulty, right? You have um, people who want to stand for council and maybe they're not, they're at odds with a group of people and um, suddenly, you know, it becomes uh, an open election where people will kind of know how other people are voting and um, that can get a little touchy. Uh, but you're right, there are ways of even ha trying to handle those sorts of circumstances to minimize, I guess, the number of people that have to know exactly how everybody voted. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, one just final comment, and we're right on time, and everybody gets to go and have a quick little break. Um, uh, Veronica, thanks so much. And just a reminder, if you're going to record, you can record your meetings, um, but... Um, get the consent of the owners at the meeting, um, majority vote, let them vote, um, and determine how that um, recording is also going to be maintained. Put that in the minutes. Um, uh, you know, what's the purpose, how long it's going to be maintained for, um, access to the recording, those types of issues. Um, you can't record 
um, secretly or quietly or um, or record and withhold the information so that no one ever has access to it. It's, it's not for the purpose of one person, but it's a good resource if you want to go back and just verify in things like voting results and decisions and motions and wording. So, <clears throat> Correct. Veronica, thanks so much. Thank you. Um, great session. That That's just super, as always. Um, um, we look forward to everything new and exciting, but it's kind of a dry subject. I know it's not. <laughs> it, it is, but you know, it's funny. Um, it While the subject is dry, the meetings can be quite uh, interesting um, be, as a result of uh, whether you follow or don't follow what you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've all been there. Yes. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for participating. Um, the PowerPoint will be available and the, the session will be um, loaded up to the um, CHOA um, YouTube website as well. You can welcome to share it with your friends or whoever. So uh, next week, our session is dealing with conflicts or managing conflicts and difficult situations before they become conflicts and difficult situations. So uh, please join us for that as well. So everyone have a wonderful afternoon.